This week, I have the greatest pleasure of speaking to Mandy Watkins, founder of Hush. Now, Hush has been in my life for the last 19 years, and I recount buying my first ever pair of pyjamas with her and how much I adored them. And you know what? It is amazing to speak to female founders where their brand DNA is literally who they are and who have built brands for over decades. And they're still as excited as they were on the first day. It's a conversation that really makes you realise that brand, that DNA, that brand heart I always talk about is so imperative to build a company that lasts a lifetime. I think we haven't seen anything yet when it comes to Mandy and what she's building at Hush. So get your notepad, pen, tea and enjoy. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down. Where we're going, you won't need to bring your frown. I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I founded Not On The High Street for my kitchen table. And since then, I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of creative small businesses. And I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement. And in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and ask them to share theirs. With thanks to Adobe, who've helped bring this podcast to life. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Hi, Mandy. It is wonderful to talk to you. You and I met, well, it must have been a couple of months ago, and I gushed over my first experience of Hush. I know all our listeners are going to absolutely love this tale. So welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Thank you very much, Holly. I was telling you, and I'm sure everyone listening is thinking, mm, what was my first piece of Hush that I bought? I was telling you about I had brown pyjamas with the blue stripe. Yeah. I loved it because it came in a bag. Yeah. Like the actual pyjamas came in a bag. And I had, I felt very grown up. This was like my entire family chipped in to buy me this. The um, brown cardigan. Yeah. The Gosh. first one. <laughs> now, would that have been really early on? That could have been actually a very first range. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I bought the white pyjamas with the little roses or the little yeah. buds. Vintage um, rose pyjamas. They... We had them for years. They were one of our best sellers for years. Such a lovely space in my heart for the brand Hush. Oh. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking to you. But in this podcast, we sort of go right back to get to know younger Mandy and a little bit about your childhood. So you grew up in Melbourne, Australia. Yeah. What was life growing up like down under? Because I read while researching you, you were quite a sporty child and you loved tennis. And I'm imagining, was it because of the outdoors and the way that you would live? Yeah. I mean, when I was a really young kid, I grew up on a dead end street. All the neighbours were sort of had children our age. We had a park at the bottom of the road. So we'd get home from school, drop our bags, go straight out to the street and just play with our mates. We'd build billy carts and looking back on it, it was kind of kid heaven. I did it. And then mum would call us at about sort of, you know, seven o'clock saying dinner time. And, you know, then we'd go in and have dinner. But up until that, it was just playing outside in the street. There weren't any cars because the only people that actually came into the road were residents. Um, so, yeah, it was it was amazing. And your parents, I believe, were also self-employed. Yeah. And they ran a, I just want to say it because I've never said it before, a grog shop. A grog shop, yeah. That's the yeah. Aussie word for an off-licence. Is that, that right? That would be yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. When you were brought up, did you have small business in the air as a family. I can imagine what they spoke about over the dinner table, et cetera, et cetera. A lot. Yeah. And and I know when I was really little, I used mum used to take me to the shop with her and I used to, you know, 
pull the sugar forward because it was it, they had groceries and grog to begin with and then just swapped to only alcohol. Um, so I would help in the shop. And yes, I know with our kids, an enormous amount of the conversation in our house centers around work. And I'm sure with mum and dad, it was it was the same thing. So you you hear about it a lot, whether you want to or not. Just as a little break in your story, I always speak to women who feel very guilty about running their businesses and bringing up children and potentially that juggle or the guilt that they're feeling about not being at every sports day or et cetera, et cetera, or not just being maybe present because they're thinking about a work issue. What's your take on that? Yeah, it is a, it, it's a tough one, isn't it? I think we've been really lucky because we've always lived close to the office and the kids have gone to school close to the office. So sports days I've been able to do, although I've also had to travel a lot for work. So there's definitely been things that I've missed out on because I haven't been in the country. And definitely you do feel guilty. And I think my daughter's 17 now and she's about to go away to university and you do. So so now she's going for good and you think, gosh, there was a, a lot of years that I missed out on a lot of time with her because of work. But then I also think there's a huge upside for them because I think I've loved it, which I think has probably made me a happier person around them. And I think, it, you know, parts of it set a good example of work ethic mm. and, and that you can do something that you love for a job and how rewarding that can be. So, oh, you yeah, know, there's, there's good and bad ups and downs yeah. and, you know. And and my and we were talking about my son's seventeen as well and is is going to be heading off soon as and I also think that potentially just at this point, maybe as working women, it's slightly I don't know, the guilt has been at bay for a while and now he's off. Yeah. It's little it's just resurging a bit at the moment because I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, this is it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this bit's it. Yeah. So you know, should I feel guilty for not being there all the time? I don't know. It's just, it's it's raising its ugly head again at the moment, a little bit. I don't know about you. And it's funny, I had a friend say to me once when my kids were really little, um, and she was a, she was a stay-at-home mum, and she said, you know, do you feel like you even really know your kids? And I was oh, what? And she said, well, you know, for the eight hours that you're at work, um, a stay-at-home mum is at home with her kids and then you come home and you've got like two hours with them and then they go to bed. So I could totally understand where she was where she was coming I from. I am so glad no um, one said that to me. Yeah, but and she wasn't saying it in a nasty way no. at all. But you still remember it to this yeah, day. Yeah, I, I, I do. <laughs> but because I remember saying to my, my husband when I first met him, he went to boarding school and I said, do you feel like you know your siblings? I mean, how, how do you know your sister when you don't even... And he's kind of like, yes, I very much feel like I know my sister because, um, you know... I went on holidays with her and all the all the other time we spent together. So I could understand where she was coming from. But, it, yeah. it, you know, it's, it is in comparison a lot of time not to spend with your kids. You studied marketing and you went on to spend seven years at sportswear giant Adidas, yeah. uh, initially in Australia yeah. and then in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, what was this experience like? And, and was that the moment that your love affair with fashion started? Yeah, I think the two jobs that I had before Adidas, I didn't like either of them. And I did think to myself, this working malarkey thing is not for me at all. <laughs> what generally? Absolutely. I really, it re I really, I really struggled with it to begin with. Then I got my job at Adidas and day one, it just, it felt like going home. It felt, it felt so comfortable and so right. I really, really loved it. And it wasn't so much the fashion side of it that I loved. I just, I think I loved the fact that the product kept on changing. So it was almost like every, new season you got a chance to start again and do it better yeah so working on something like Vegemite where the brand never changes and you might get to sort of slightly update the logo once every 10 years didn't really interest me at all but something where the product's always changing I loved that side of it but didn't really have any desire to work in fashion like you think about sort of fashion that sort of yeah that wasn't oh the high that was a bit that was a bit the intimidating fashion world. that yeah that didn't really excite me and and when you were in hong kong your personal life changed as well because you met your boyfriend now husband yeah 
and you ultimately you decided to move to the UK, yeah, which is obviously a pretty big move. Did you have any plans at that stage to start a business? I didn't. No, always in the back of my mind, wanted to work for myself. I think having parents that work for themselves, yeah, it just seemed like a natural course to me. But I didn't really, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So, yeah, I, I came over here and I got a job working for three, the mobile phone business, and I really didn't enjoy it at all and started writing a business plan while I was there thinking I could well get made redundant from this job, partly because I'm rubbish at it and <laughs> partly because they're making a lot of people redundant. Yeah, And I thought that's what I need because if I get made redundant, I'll get a redundancy um, package and that will give me the money that I need to start it. So fortunately, they promoted me before they made me redundant, having oh, no, that was just how bad I was. <laughs> no, that was actually quite great, Holly, because I went from sort of, you know, a three-week notice period to a three-week, sorry, to a three-month notice period, <gasps> yes. which meant my redundancy payout was much bigger than it otherwise would have been. And I sort of thought to myself, okay, it's kind of now, now's the time to either move back to Oz mm -hmm. or start this business. And Rue said, well, if we move back to Oz, I just want one more summer in the UK. And I sort of thought, okay, well, I'll just get an anything job just to tide me over until we move back. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll just have a crack at starting it. And um, and, 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 and this was it. And this was, and that was it. And 19 it made me, years ago. 90. Yeah, I, yeah, we 19. Was, I mean, can you believe it? I can't. Can you believe I just, it? <laughs> no. <laughs> it made me laugh when I read a quote from you that said, uh, you're an Aussie who moved to the UK to be with your boyfriend and you had this crazy idea that you could start your own fashion brand in a country where you knew next to no one. The The vision for the brand, how did it start? Because it's it's literally quite practical, isn't it? Yeah. It was, it was I, I, to do with the fact that you couldn't handle our weather. Well, it did come <laughs> as a surprise to me, the weather, even though everyone sort of says, you know, it's not great. I think it was the dark at like 4.30, which is really 4 o'clock. I, I thought there's just no way. That's not physically possible. And I had a long commute to work. It was an hour and a half there and back. And I'd get back in and it would be dark and wet and cold and Rue would say, do you fancy going out? And I'm like, are you serious? I've just been on the tube for like an hour and a half. It's miserable outside. I don't fancy going anywhere. So I sort of thought, okay, until this weather picks up, I'll be spending lots of time inside. So I need a pair of Ugg boots because my feet are freezing and that's what we wear as slippers at home. Couldn't find them anywhere. I need something that I'm just going to make me feel better about being in and make the most of like nights in. So, you know, cook nice food, read great books, watch great movies and just slog through this, you know, by doing that. So that's kind of where the idea came from. And tell me what, how did the name come about? Um, I think it just, one thing I do remember from, you know, my days at university was if you're picking a name, pick a name that goes beyond just the product you're doing so don't call it like pajama land or something like that yeah um yeah. and and hush just seemed to sort of encapsulate that whole sort of quiet time type you know mm. cozy nights I don't know I just it just seemed when I thought of it I thought actually yeah that really works and also I sort of thought if we do move beyond sort of you know the house and pjs and because we did hot hot chocolate and um, and the slippers and then it'll still make sense as a name, as a brand name. So, yeah. When I speak to small businesses, I normally call it um, someone's brand heart. You know, almost everything that I suppose you as a founder feel mm -hmm. being put into the brand. So there you are. It's only because you're from Australia. Did you even think of this idea? You know, it's the idea that you wanted to be inside, that you wanted more from your brand than just the loungewear. I yeah. remember when I went onto the site right from the beginning, it had, am I right in thinking that you would give ideas of movies or yeah. there was other bits yeah. going towards it? Yeah. And I, I remember thinking, my gosh, this is feeling like she knows me, you know, that there is a an emotional bond. And I, again, talk about this emotional connection. I think they're the best brands when I can feel the founder through the items I'm buying. Well, I think the thing also with us was I didn't know anyone here. I've been living, I've lived here for two years. We didn't have a mailing list. We had a list of like, I, I think, 200 people, 
all of whom were kind of friends or friends of friends. So I felt like for a really long time, we didn't get an order from somebody who either wasn't a mate or a relative <laughs> of Rue's. Um, and I remember the first time getting an order and seeing somebody's name and thinking, I don't recognise that name. Wow, this is from an outsider. And Rue then saying, no, actually, it's my auntie, just different surname. <laughs> um, but for a really long time, it felt like I was sending things to friends because I was. And I think you probably think, I don't know, I always say to our, our staff, now try and think of the customer as a friend. So I remember putting in recipes for my one of my mum's soups, which I'd loved, in with all the orders and yes recommending books recommending movies that I'd love that you wanted to share but it, it felt like you were sharing things with friends because I literally was and if you think now you know almost 20 years on we're maybe more potentially in tune because we hear maybe other founders talking about this connection that you can build with your customers but 20 years ago that wasn't something you you know you did you know there weren't many brands that would you know, pop in my mum's soup into the package because you were already believing that you were creating a world for your your customer to live in. You yeah. were you were visualizing the world that they wanted to live in and that, yeah. that that's something that you shared together. Do you think that's an important part of the DNA of a great brand that can stand the test of time? You might not have known it then. It, it probably just felt nice to do. Yeah. <laughs> but now when you look back 20 years on. I think it's 100% the difference between a brand that people have an emotional connection with and a brand that they don't. That is the massive difference. If you were maybe thinking about small businesses now starting, and obviously it's a difficult period of time that we find ourselves in, what would be some advice that you would give in terms of that brand building? Because would you say, Mandy, that that's one of the biggest assets that you have at Hush? Yeah, but I also think it's one of the massive advantages of being small because it's, you know, I'm so passionate about it in a way that really no one else is going to be as passionate about it as you are. And, you know, when you get bigger, you have to give certain responsibilities to other people, but it's not going to come as from the heart. So yeah. I, I think it is a, a real advantage for a small business. You know, you, you've got a very strong tone of voice, a very strong sort of purpose, because it's, you know, from here, yeah. From, yeah, from one person. Heart. Yeah, from yeah. Your, yeah. Do you think that brand is something that you knew was going to be the vessel that carried Hush through the years? It's funny, it really wasn't deliberate, but yes, it has been very, very important. It's like the most important thing, I think, in the business. So yes, um, I think without that, you're just another clothing business selling clothing. And let's face it, you know, a t-shirt is a t-shirt. It's why you mm -hmm. want to buy it from that brand versus that brand that ultimately makes the difference, doesn't it? because you feel a connection with a brand, one brand over another brand, so you, that one appeals to you more. But essentially, white T-shirt's a white T-shirt. Tell me about those early days of getting the business off the ground. So you've now got Rue's aunt who had another name buying yeah. from you. You thought yeah. it was a stranger. It wasn't. But no. then there must have been some strangers, there, like myself, starting to buy from you. Yeah. Go back to those first days. I don't know if I met you. We might have met, but I met you at the Spirit of Christmas yeah. when you had a stand and it looked amazing. But I think that you'd been going for a few years before that. So working we're working from home and I knew nothing. I remember we I used to take all the orders up to the post office because I didn't even know that Royal Mail would come and collect them from you. And it was slow, Holly. I remember my, you know, thinking if I could just get to 15 orders, that would be amazing. So you'd have days with no orders? Days with no orders at all. And also thinking... I might never get another order ever again as well. <laughs> There's only so many pairs of pyjamas Rue's aunt could buy from exactly. you. Exactly. I think I've exhausted all my friends. And it really, the the press was amazing. We were, I was really lucky that um, they kind of picked up on it because it did feel like when something would go in the press, there'd be a surge of orders and then it would quieten back down again and then something else would go in and there'd be a surge. But Spirit of Christmas was also fantastic for us as a small business because I think it introduced us to a lot of people. It was 
full on doing Spirit of Christmas because by that stage, I think I'd had Rosie and we had somebody looking after her during the day, but not after work. And so I'd be working during the day, but then having to set up the stand at Spirit of Christmas in the evenings and, and you weren't allowed to have kids in the hall while you're setting up the stand. So Rue would come because he needed to do all the stuff that was up high and I'd go outside and hold Rosie while and say, oh you need to do gosh. this up high. <laughs> so it was quite full on in the beginning. And was the event, was that a turning point for you? I think it did make a big difference to us. Yeah. And we did it for you know, I think seven or eight years I was at Spirit of Christmas for, and every year our stand would get slightly bigger. And then eventually it was kind of like, okay, Ruth, I remember Ruth saying we took, I came home and he said, how much did you take today? And I told him and he said, we took more online than that today. And at that point I thought, okay, well, next year I won't do Spirit of Christmas. <laughs> um, yeah. So do you think that that still applies today, that getting your brand out you know, meeting people. Do you think it was all about you speaking to customers, telling them about the clothing, the difference? Rather, because I think we're so online, aren't we now? We so we can, you know, Holly and Co. launched on Instagram. I'm digital. You know, lots of people can just literally be behind a computer screen. To, so that change for you to yeah. actually be out there. You think was important? You still do? I, I definitely, I think also you get to interact with your customers in a way that you can't interact with them online. You get to see what their reaction is. I mean, women, bless them, because they will just sort of strip off and try things on, you know, at a yeah. stand at Spirit of Christmas, despite the fact that you haven't got a changing room. So you get <laughs> to see what your garment looks like on different body shapes. You get to, and you get to speak to them and, and hear what they love and what they don't like so much or why something's fantastic for them and why something's less so, which you just don't get on mm. online. So I think it is really, really valuable. I think one of my other marketing tools way, way back when was not knowing the UK particularly well at all. I thought, okay, I'll, I had like 10,000 catalogs printed up and clearly not many people to send them to other than the 250 people I knew on the mating. And, um, and I thought I'll go to Notting Hill because there's lots of people with lots of money living in Notting Hill and I'll do a letterbox <laughs> drop with all my catalogs. Not thinking it through at all because catalogues are actually really pretty heavy and the houses in Notting Hill are really big. So the space between one house and another and got absolutely nothing back from that. So not one new customer and I hadn't spoken to anybody either. So um, that was just, you know, sending your stuff out there and, and hoping for the best. So not one of my best marketing ideas. So that was your first catalogue yep. and you were hand, literally hand delivering them. I did hand deliver some, yes. I was talking to someone last night and, and I said to her, you've not even started. This starting game requires you to put the marigolds on and it requires you to literally be out there doing everything, you know, uh, working all the hours. I can't tell you that it's easy. I don't think any business that's ever started is easy. You, I can't wave a magic wand, nor can I tell you a fast cut or a silver bullet. Do you think that, Mandy, you're coming into 20 years? This is about slog. Yeah. But I think it doesn't feel like a slog, no, Holly, because you I'm, love I'm, it. I'm, I know. Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah. But it is. It is. A girlfriend of mine said that her son, her husband's self-employed and her son's decided he's going to go out into his own business. And he said to her, I am not doing what dad did. I am not working every hour that God sent. I am doing this the smart way. I've read the book. It's the three-day working week book. And I'm going to be super successful on three days a week. And I said to my girlfriend, well, I don't know. In my experience, no. Um, <laughs> but maybe he'll work seven days and it'll feel like three. But I don't imagine he'll work three days and get the same results mm -hmm. that his dad got because his dad yeah. worked seven. <laughs> um, and he, yeah. So, you know, people say he can work s smarter, but you, you've not found that yet. No. I really haven't. And I don't think we're not smart, right? Yeah, I think that's the point. And I think it is. Would you say that the brand you've built is because of all those hours, all those, the sweat, blood and tears continuously for 19 years? You know, that builds a foundation, doesn't it, in brand equity, in the, your customers, it, 
the fact you're still here, the founder's still part of Hush, it speaks volumes, doesn't it? We hope so. I hope so. Oh, it does. <laughs> yeah. It does. I think, you know, it really does. And I, I love that you are still at the helm and driving it forward. What were some of your biggest challenges during that startup time? We started online and I remember actually going to a company that had built the website for three and saying, I, I want to start my own business and I, I need an online website and coming back and saying to Rue, well, I'm not going to be able to do this because the amount of money that they've told me it's going to cost to build the website is pretty much the amount of money I've got for the entire business. <laughs> and he said, well, that's bollocks. Um, we'll find somebody else. And we ended up finding a, a brother of a mate who did it for way less. So, But there were so many challenges when I first, I mean, it just, just feels like you're constantly, you know, coming up to brick walls and trying to find ways around them. And I remember thinking, like being really stressed in the beginning and saying to a girlfriend who worked for herself, like, how do you actually sleep at night? I go to bed thinking, oh my gosh, what happens about this? And what about this? And and I was thinking, looking back on it now, you do look at it, you think it's it's just problem solving. You know, things yeah. go wrong all the time. All the if time. They, if they didn't, it would be easy. But no one problem is going to be the end of it all. And sometimes, you know, in the beginning, I felt like they were going to be the end, like this shipment's been delayed and the cardigans that you've ordered are going to be, you know, a month late. But you find ways around it all. And do you think you gain confidence each time? You... I think you do. I think you get used to it. You just you just get used to it because you can't control them. I know I've just been on a, you know, a shoot to South Africa and we got stuck in the lift for an hour and a half when you're meant to be out go, there's, you know, what do you do about that? And then the weather that was meant to be beautiful was awful and just, and the model that I'd booked, the agency accidentally got the wrong girl and the girl that I wanted was, you know, in Italy, not in South Africa and just all of these things. And you just kind of think, okay, fine. Well, all we'll in do, a day's work, all in a day's work. Whereas at the beginning, <laughs> I would have just would have been way more stressful than it uh, than it now is. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm listening to. Have you got a lovely dog oh, snoring sure. his head? Oh, sorry, on? I have. Yes. Oh no, oh, I have two here. <laughs> I have two here as well. And I was just yes. thinking, oh my gosh, I might have to wake them up because the snoring's about to start. But anyway, yeah. I just want. She's to actually let you... awake, Holly. That's just that's her daytime snoring. Oh, yes. that's her just that's, breathing. That's her just just enjoying sitting in the sun. Yeah. Oh, how long? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, you've always been one step ahead with your marketing and Hush has always been a very editorial brand with this, as we were saying, strong emphasis, not just on clothes and products, but this lifestyle. And right back in the start in 2003, long before social media, uh, you were producing catalogues. Tell me about this. Was this an important part of maybe born out of, I don't know, naivety. We were just talked about your first lot of catalogues that you handed out, but that you wanted to get the notion of hush out there more than just its digital presence. And and you still do, right? I still get the hush catalogues. Yep. And tell me about this. And by the way, I, I, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Oh, tell you. me about the analogue versus digital and you must have over 19 years had that debate internally or not maybe that we have we have I have my husband was a journalist before we started before we started working together so I think that you know um storytelling is probably part of the DNA of the brand because of him as much as mm -hmm. me or even more because of him he's a good storyteller and, you know, in the beginning, it was a, we definitely go online. I didn't want to shop because mum and dad had shops. Yeah. And dad always said to me, Mandy, find yourself a job where you work Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30, and you don't have to be there to make money. And online felt like a really good way to do that. I didn't want to be stuck in a, in a shop. Mm -hmm. And I also felt like a catalogue was a good way to communicate the lifestyle that I was trying to tap into. And I think it's easier to do that in a catalogue than it almost is online. Online feels a little bit more like the where you go to make the sale as opposed to where you go mm. to really buy into the brand. And so much more 
even nowadays when, you know, people would land on our homepage in the olden days. But now, you know, you don't know where they're going to land and they might just land on a product page. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like the catalog's an opportunity for you to really create a story. Um, yes. Which is harder to do online. But, yes. But is also possible in a shop. I think a physical environment. Yeah. And that was our, that was more like, that was our sort of, your, you know. Your version. Yeah. Yeah. You've not gone in to having hush shops all over every single high street. We haven't, no. We're in John Lewis. Tell me why. Um, Does it, is, is it your dad in your ear? I, I think I think it is, in part. Um, I just sort of think, gosh, when the girl that's meant to be working on Saturday can't work on Saturday for a long time, I thought, I, I don't want to mm -hmm. be getting that call and, and sort of saying to the kids, I'm now working on Saturday because I've got to cover the person that can't. But there is part of it really appeals to me, having a, you know, bringing the whole brand to life in a store. So who knows? You know, maybe going forward. Yeah. And may maybe, you know, when somebody else gets the call when the person is not available on Saturday <laughs> I don't rather think than me. you're getting the call, um, Monty, now. You've so, gone long past that point of getting the call. <laughs> well, I don't know. We still get the calls when the alarm goes off in yes. the office in the middle of the night. So, um, but do, what do you think about, do, does the high street excite you as it is today? Or potentially, is that a voice along? side your father's voice because you know you only have to go out there I do think there's a few brands popping up but I do think we've got a lot of um, weight and historic um, brands that potentially need to leave the high street or we've got do you know what I mean it, it feels that we're in a flux and so potentially is that ringing in your mind or actually are you excited potentially if you were to go onto the high street I think my thing with the high street is I sometimes go out and obviously look at stores and I think so often the experience in one store versus another store is not particularly different or inspiring. I think if you could create a store when where somebody walked into it, when they walked out, they felt better off for having had that experience. Yes. And to me, I don't even think about it from a product perspective. I sort of think if I walked into a store and I heard a great song playing or it smelt really nice or there was a piece of furniture or a piece of art in there that I thought, wow, that's amazing. Or the girl that I was chatting to that was working there, I don't know, had amazing nail polish colour on. And I also happen to love the product and work, walk out with a great outfit or there was a book recommendation, all of those things. Mm. I think if you could create a store where you make the effort to come in, we'll make sure it pays off. I think that would be a fantastic experience to give people. But I acknowledge it's not that easy to do because there's probably not that many people that are doing that. As you know, I'm passionate about celebrating small businesses and championing creativity within all of us. That's why I'm thrilled to be working with Adobe Express, who each week are handing over their ad break to a small business founder, shining a light on their own businesses and sharing how Adobe Express really is helping fuel their creativity. Hi, I'm Jay, founder of Bobo's. I customise and personalise toy animals which can be used as cake toppers or displayed in the home. I really think you might need to go and take a look. I actually started out creating textile items for children and parties just before my daughter was born. But over the years, the demand for my party animals has taken over. A massive part of our branding has been to create uplifting content which puts a smile on the face of our audience. It's no secret as the founder of a small business, you will be juggling every single job role. So saving time and money is key. I've had a play with Adobe Express this week and it's so easy to use. In fact, I found it very intuitive. Definitely no special training needed for this technophobe. Social media plays a massive role in bringing sales to my business. It's so important to have good imagery and marketing media to use across all platforms. I occasionally outsource this work, but as a small business, it's not always sustainable. Designs on Adobe Express can be tweaked easily to preset sizes, making them ready to use across all platforms like Facebook, Instagram stories and reels, emails and your website. I can see moving forward this app can really help me create good marketing imagery that looks professional but isn't costly or time consuming. 
There are so many designs which pre-exist to use as a starting point, so much better than a blank page. The feature I liked best was seamlessly making my background disappear on photographs, something I currently take a long time erasing. If you'd like to come and party with all of the animals, you can follow me on Instagram at Bobos or find us at bobos.co.uk, where I have set up a special discount code for 15% off using the code HOLLYCO. Thank you once more to Adobe, who have helped to make this podcast episode happen. If you want to find out more about Adobe Express and how it can help your business, head over to adobe.com slash go slash Holly Tucker. Now let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. After the pandemic, a lot of people, I suppose, had this notion that everything out there was, I don't know, very colour, you know, the grass was greener, you know, we were all stuck inside for two years and the grass was greener and you went out. And actually, I think that we now want to demand a lot more from our brands because for the brands that stayed the same as 2018-19, to have that, you know, you come to the high street and actually it's pretty bog standard. You walk in, as you say, there's no nice music playing The same products that you sort of saw two years ago are still there. The lady behind the counter is not that interested in you coming in. These are the brands that just are going to die because I think that we have had, I think it was coming anyway, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. But it's just everything has fast forwarded. Mm -hmm. And so now we're looking for brands, as you said, that is it's more, it is an experience, you know, not a helicopter ride experience, but a an experience of sorts. Yeah. And I think, though, for the brands that are brave enough to go for it, it's all for the taking <laughs> because it's been mm-hmm. done so badly out there. So I'm looking yeah. forward to maybe potentially who who oh. knows, Mandy? Who um, knows? Tell me the rise of fast fashion, particularly in the last decade. I can imagine that a, as a clothing retailer, that this time has been scary to witness not just because of maybe competitors, but also just your industry maybe behaving badly. When you can buy a dress for two pounds, what's your thoughts on fast fashion? Obviously, you have nothing to do with it. But you know what I mean? Like your colleague, not your colleagues, but the industry at large. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously a massive problem. I don't know, Holly, it's a, it's a really tricky one. I, I don't really look at us, at, at us as competing with fast fashion brands because I think if you're if you're after that you're probably not going to be wanting to shop with us the rules need to change don't they um from a government social Mm. perspective that we just need to be in a position where we're saying you know um somebody's telling me that it's just Shein I think it's called yes I was looking at the number of products that they create in a season and you just and what are we talking about it's criminal um like you can add up H&M Zara and you know all of the others and you don't get close to what Shein I mean massive absolutely massive and I guess they only exist because people buy it but I know I I have two children and if, uh, you know, it's not the only reason, but it's important to me that they're proud of what we do. So, you know, have that back of your as, mind, back of my mind as, as well when I'm sort of thinking. And, and also the people that work for us are really, really on it. And, um, and they don't want to be creating product that's creating a problem. I mean, ultimately it's, it's clothing. It's, it's not great for the environment, but that you can certainly do it in ways that are much better and much worse. And we will always try and do it in ways that are much better. I liked what you said about, you know, when you think about how maybe to tackle this issue, supply is trying to create demand rather than the other way around. So, you know, rather than this, you know, cause one of the issues, isn't it, is that it's ridiculously oversupplied. That's, Sean, it would be, you know, the magnitude of literally what they must hold as stock and et cetera, et cetera. Isn't that the way maybe around it, that the supply is actually fueling, creating demand, that you're waiting for it or you're you're trying to get hold of it or What's your thoughts? And, and and or do you think there's other ways that this can be tackled through the industry? Do you think it's down to the government? 
I think it is down to the government in part, but I also just think it's it's society. I look I look at Instagram and you and you think you know mm. never the same outfit twice kind of thing. And I'm 53, so I'm much older. But for younger people, they look at that. And back in my day, you you had one outfit that you wore out. You you didn't have a different outfit for every party that you went to. Mm. So I think there's huge pressure on on people to buy. So uh, I'm not probably giving you a straightforward or good answer to any of this, Holly. But no, but I hadn't even thought of that. There's, uh, there's actually also, so yeah, you're right, social media and this huge life that we live through it creates its own sort of demands. I hadn't really actually thought yeah. of that, you know. So there there must and and especially for youth and as you said, TikTok and Insta, all of that, how you show up because you're now literally on show. Yeah. So of course you need clothing to be on show. Hopefully, show. by the way, Mandy, you need clothing <laughs> to be on show, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you know, those are other things. Um tell me about sustainability and this this is all part of the same um, subject that we're speaking about. Are you seeing a change in shopping responsibly with your customers? And is it a shift that you're feeling that you want to embrace more and more with Hush? Um, we're definitely, definitely seeing a change. And it is a conversation in our office, a, a constant conversation. So I, I think it, it is the future of and I, I think it's just now, it's it's a given. Like, mm -hmm. to be a successful brand, you have to be doing everything you possibly can and getting better at becoming more sustainable all the time. Because if you're not, then I think that, you know, there is no longevity for your brand. Because yeah. you're quite sustainable anyway by not being trend-led, I suppose, just even to, as your starting block out of this. Yeah, and also, I mean, we spend a lot of time, you know, fitting garments. So hopefully when she gets them, they fit well, they're good quality, they will last, and you can wear them for season after season after season. All of those things, I, I think, definitely help, you know, other brands that are not putting the time into that, wear it once and on to the next thing. And you've recently appointed a sustainability coordinator. Steph's been with us for a few years now and has now got an assistant. And I think for a business of our size, which is, I think we employ now maybe, I don't know, mm -hmm. 150, 160 people. Yes. To have two people. And what what do they do? So I read that um, you said you think you're doing the right thing with a catalogue made from recycled paper, for example, and then discover the ink may mean that it's actually unable to be recycled or something. Yeah. I mean, it's so complicated, Holly. And it's and it's all aspects of the business. I know even with our packaging, I think we spent a year trying to find tape to close up the boxes that was recyclable. So, I mean, it's, it's so many areas. And then you've got all the factories that you work with, but not only the factories, all of the, you know, trims mm. and... Um, and it, it's it's a it's a beast. And and have they caught up yet? So you you've got control over the tape. You've got control potentially over the ink. But as you go wider, is it getting harder? I think it's actually getting much easier because there's so many, you know, there's so much demand for things that are more environmentally friendly, which makes them more affordable and also, you know makes businesses and suppliers um, more focused on being able to supply that sort of stuff. So I think it's it's definitely got mm. easier in many respects. You know, there's access to... Oh, my, my dog's really loud, isn't she, Harley? No, I, I, by the way, it's making me calm. It's just, <gasps> oh, I good. love it. It's like, it's like we've got the car map on. And what's her name? Frankie. It's like Frankie's got her own calm app and it's just the snore. Whereas my husband would say snoring isn't that um, calming, Holly, actually. Um, but I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> you recently launched an intern collection at yes. Hush. Yes, yeah. Tell me about this because this sounds great. And also, just before you even tell me about this, 19 years into your business, you, we were just talking about sustainability. We were just talking about... You know, Spirit of Christmas, events, catalogues, 160 members of staff, all of that entails. How do you keep 
yourself, Mandy, going in terms of as a founder, not not holistically, but as a businesswoman? Is it by inventing things like the intern collection? Is it about always looking beyond and seeing what's happening in the next two, three years? Yeah, I just think you can you can always do it so much better. So I think that's what keeps me going. It's just this desire to do it better. And I will never be happy with the way that it is. I think I used to kid myself that, okay, next season we'll get it perfect and you'll never get it perfect. And I think that's what that's what excites me. I really love all the people that I work with. I love working. Mm. So, yeah, it's been easy to keep on going. Um, but the intern collection, I, I think, has been really a brilliant. It wasn't my idea. It was our head of product's idea. And she didn't even really think that much of it. And when she said, I'm thinking we could do this, it's kind of, that's amazing, Sheila. Tell that's me what it is. a brilliant idea. So it's basically that we've got interns from different departments who essentially, they do the real job. They're not there, you know, they have a mentor from each department. So they'll get a mentor from design, a mentor from merch um, that they work with, who's kind of helping them, but they build an intern range. So they're actually doing the job that they wow. are hoping to do. So the designer is designing, the buyer buys for the range that, you know, so it's not coming in and photocopying and kind of just yes. sitting at the back. It's actually doing the job. We're trying to get interns from possibly less obvious places to try and you know help with diversity so I just think it's been I mean they've loved it we did a shoot with them the other day where they're all in the clothing they've loved it and it's really lovely to be able to give people that opportunity and and see them really thrive with it and enjoy it it's been great incredible and also an amazing way of potentially inserting the hush DNA into these young, amazing people and potentially will end up becoming full yeah. time with you? Or? That's, that's the problem because they were fantastic and you want to keep them all. And the designer we actually have kept, but it's kind of like, okay, the whole point, Mandy, is that they they do their time and then they move on oh. and you don't get to keep, keep them all because we actually don't have jobs for them all at this point. We can't just keep every intern that's worked for us, but the designer has stayed and who knows, some of the others might be back. I know when I spoke to Marcia Kilgore, founder of Fit Flop and Beauty Pie, I asked her what her secret was about creating products that people want to buy. And she said, and I totally believe this, that she creates things she wants to buy herself and she's her own customer. I know your husband is now fully fledged as part of the business and Hush remains largely family owned. How do you look at that today? Is that still your driving, sort of the DNA, if you see what I mean? Is it still you? I mean, there's so many people in there that now that are doing, that are so much smarter and better at things than I am. But I think I used to try everything on before the shoot to make sure that the outfits kind of work. And I still do it, Holly. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, God, if I'm still doing this at 50 and I'm still down there doing it at 50. And I think a lot of our product has been informed, though, by me doing that. Because mm. I think, gosh, if I just had a top that sat a bit higher or a bit lower so I could wear this tucked in this way. or So I think that definitely helps. And, you know, trying everything on helps. And also you know, thinking, and it, it is, you know, would I wear this? What would I want for that occasion or this? You know, could I wear that out and then work and da 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 da, da. I think it all makes a difference, yeah. And so, yeah, the founder DNA is very much alive. I remember speaking to Robin from the Pig Hotel Group and him and his wife, every single new pig, they would stay in every single room. Yeah. Every single room they would stay mm -hmm. in. Whatever, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. how many hotels they had launched because they knew that the light fitting didn't work properly or actually the towel should be on the other side or this bed wasn't as comfortable as it should be. And there is something about that. That's the meticulousness of a founder. That's it. And I think that is your massive advantage because you really, really care. Mm. You want it to be... Amazing. You kind of think, if this parcel arrived in my house, do I want it wrapped in tissue paper, smelling beautiful, with a recipe in there? 
in a nice box or do I want it in a plastic bag in a plastic bag? And the answer slightly is then becomes simple, doesn't it? You're like, well, I know exactly what I want. Which I think is why I find it much easier working for myself because I'm not trying to second guess. I just think, you know, I'm not trying to second guess what my boss would like um, or how she would do it. I'm just thinking this is what I would like as a customer. So that's what we'll do. And the future, Mandy? Are you enjoying it as much as you did in that? Well, le- there's less stands to put up and you holding the baby outside, uh, you know, long hours at the spirit of Christmas. But are you still that excited? I still love it. I still love it. Yeah. I, and I think someone was saying to me the other day, you're just a bit weird, Mandy, though. You're a bit weird. We were, we were talking about going down to a four day week and I'm thinking, oh, I quite like a, I like a five day week, though. I'm good with a five day week. Does that make me a bit weird? And they're like, yeah, it does make you a bit weird. But, you know. I end all my interviews, Mandy, with this analogy that running your own business is often like being on an epic roller coaster. And I think you'll probably totally agree. You would look obviously pretty cool in your loungewear. I mean, it's gone way beyond loungewear, of course. It does absolutely everything. My entire office, when they knew I was interviewing you, freaked out because I think I like had a office full of everyone wearing hush that day. It was just amazing. But I like to think back to that first pajamas that I had. So I'm I'm picturing you in the roller coaster. What would you say has been one of your biggest lows on this journey? Um, I think the pandemic. Um, so when COVID first hit, I, I remember feeling absolutely terrified because I just thought, okay, unforeseeable and through no fault of your own, it could all just go, that, that could be the end. That could be the end. You could be, you know, looking for a job, working for somebody else, um, having once been self-employed. So that was really stressful and also gave me an insight into what it's like to be really stressed and what effects that has on, I feel like I was less, way less patient as a mother at that time. I remember trying to tell my daughter that she couldn't have her mobile phone up in her bedroom to sleep with and um, she was kicking off and I was kind of like, seriously? Mm. I didn't have a a huge amount of um, energy to negotiate with her. I mean, Um, I know that that conversation as well. Did you lose it? I lost it. I lost. (laughs) Um, She's 17. No, me too. And I used to always just say it has to be away from your head, right? It has to be. So I would go in in the morning and there it would be Mm. tucked underneath the pillow. (laughs) And and I I just, you know, it got to the point of doing it for years that I'm like, okay, this is, this is just going to happen at uni. It's a battle I'm now going to lose. I'm going to lose it gracefully. Yes. But actually how unbelievable that that was your fear because am I right in thinking that was the opposite that happened? Yeah, you are. You are. So when did you feel, when did you go from that being terrified to, oh my gosh, this might be the, not the making of Hush, but you know, this accelerated growth we didn't expect? It was two weeks where, um, you know, orders just plummeted and returns were coming in thick and fast. I think when everybody panicked and they just sort of thought, okay, we're sending everything back, not spending any money. And and then everyone was thoroughly bored and went shopping online and shopping for exactly the sort of stuff that we were selling. The weather just kept on 100% working in our favour. So just as we're about to sell out of something, the weather would change and the desire would, you know, shift onto something else. You just thought, like, that never happens, Holly. (laughs) Um, You're always thinking, gosh, if we couldn't just, you know, the sun wouldn't just shine now that we've launched our sort of summer collection. So that was really lucky. So, you know, it went from, like, the worst to also, you know, what ended up being a, a really lucky experience. And also... It brought the business, everyone in the business, the sense of camaraderie was was pretty amazing. Even when you were remote, um, you felt yeah, connected even yeah, more. Cause you, yeah, we Because it must have taken a lot of logistics yeah. to pull off growing at a time where we weren't all set up to do this. Yeah, yeah. And getting stock was really challenging because of, you know, factories shutting down and then you couldn't get anything on a boat and all of that. So it was exhausting, like really exhausting. But also, you know, there was this there was this feeling of, you know, we're all exciting and thrilling. Yeah. And your greatest high on that roller coaster? 
Ah, uh, there's been so so many highs. I think you know we're going to our first hush wedding in in a few months' time. So two people that actually met oh. at the office. <laughs> I've seen. I've seen some of our girls go from their first job to, you know, boyfriends and breakups to then getting married and and having babies. I've been on amazing trips. I've been to sort of Zanzibar and Mexico and obviously Australia. And so there's just been loads of highs. It's just been amazing. I sort of feel like I've you give a business a lot, you do, but I feel like it's given me so much more, so much more than I've given it. Did you find Mandy through your business? This is something I was saying to someone the other day that I feel like maybe I found who Holly was. I, I mean, it's it's a parallel path, isn't it? Growing up and running your business. But I don't know. I feel like as when you just said it, it gave me shivers when you just said my business gave me so much more. I feel like I discovered so much about myself. It was like a path of self-discovery. Definitely. I feel like it's pushed me in so many ways that life probably wouldn't have pushed me had I had I not done it. Yeah. yeah. You work out what you can do in a way that maybe you, because you wouldn't have to work that out. And and there's lots of other ways I'm sure you can do that. But for me, this has been that way. This has just been awesome, Mandy. I loved every single second of it. I have been a huge fan of yours forever, obviously, standing on that stand, (laughs) however many years ago that is. Yes. Yes. I mean, I I actually am going to take a photograph. Do you know, I still think I have the brown bag. Oh, I love it. Because I that's obviously it. what you wanted your customers to do was to keep the, yeah, bag, keep the bag and use it when yeah. you go on holiday to put all your little bits in and you can that's organize your suitcase. Yeah. I think I've still got it. I'm going to send you a picture. Oh, please do. Now, Molly. listen, I think you have prepared a letter to your younger self. I have indeed. We're going to have uh, a snoring, or not snoring, a breathing, a bulldog's breathing <laughs> background music yep. to this letter, yep. which is unique. Very it's important. the first ever time we've had bulldog noise <laughs> behind it. But I'm going to hand over to you. I don't know what you're going to say, but thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your soul with us today, Mandy. Thank you very much for having me, Holly. Okay. Dear Mandy, Okay, first of all, that perm and the blue eyeshadow, just no. Not then, not now, not ever. And a few other pointers. You might want to pay a bit more attention in French. I know Paris seems like a long way away for a young girl growing up in Melbourne, but something more than parlez-vous anglaise might come in useful if you fall in love with a pom and find yourself living in Europe. If you want to have smart kids, have sex with smart people. Even if they do get your brain, at least they'll have someone to help with their homework. Marry your best mate. If you fancy your best mate, even better. And finally, when you're driving a car into a petrol station and can't remember what side the petrol cap is, you really don't need to get out of the car to have a look. There's a little arrow on the petrol gauge to tell you. Who knew? And I don't think you should have to wait until you're 53 to discover this. So this letter is supposed to be full of good advice from the me of today to the me of 30 odd years ago. I could pre-warn you of all the things that didn't pan out the way you hoped. But where's the fun in that? Making mistakes is part of life. Not always the most enjoyable part, although I can promise some will be great fun, but definitely the most valuable. So live life your way, make your mistakes, learn your lessons and move on. No, the only lessons I can give you are the ones you're probably working out already. Life doesn't just happen. You need to get out there and make it happen. Say yes, have a crack. All the best things happen when you say yes. I've lived half my life now away from my home, my mum and my dad and my sister. I love them and I miss them every day. But I know that saying yes to that one year posting in Hong Kong almost 30 years ago absolutely changed my life. I wouldn't have met my husband if I had taken the easy option and stayed in Melbourne. I wouldn't have had my two beautiful kids if I hadn't left Hong Kong and moved to London. I wouldn't have started Hush if I'd stuck to my original plan and gone home. And I would have missed out on so many of the amazing friends and incredible experiences I've had over the years. As I say, life gets better when you say yes. Be kind, be humble. You had a great start in life. You'll need a lot of luck along the way and you won't get anywhere without the help of lots of people far smarter than you. You don't need to feel guilty about that, but you should recognize it and be grateful. 
<laughs> Don't be a dick. It isn't a bad motto. No one likes a dick and life's no fun without mates to share it with. Don't obsess over the destination. Just make sure that you enjoy the journey. Anyone who gets to make their hobby their job, or better still, build a business from it, is incredibly lucky. But whatever you do, try to get the most out of it. Sure, it's great to achieve your goal, but the goalposts are always changing. It's the game and your teammates you remember, not the score. And that's about it. Don't learn to cook. Veggie mash or eggs on toast does the job. As my mum, your mum, used to say, it doesn't pay to show yourself too capable at anything. You'll get stuck with it. I promise you, I've followed her advice to the letter. If you do have to cook, apparently TSP is teaspoon, not tablespoon. Not a good one to get wrong when you're adding chilli to a recipe. But that's probably not a bad place to finish. Add chilli. Life's better with a bit of added spice. Kiss, kiss, oh. kiss. <laughs> Brilliant. You go. I hope you're okay with the swearing, Holly. Of course, this is a swearing podcast. <laughs> Excellent. TSP, I just, I can't cook either. I just absolutely loved every second of that. And what is that about the petrol? Um, oh. What, what, what is that? My husband told me that the other day. Literally, when you look at your petrol, the yeah. little, you know, the petrol yes. tank gauge, there is an arrow which tells you on the side of the petrol gauge. Yeah that the side that the arrow is on is where your the, 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 the thing the, is. The yes. thing is that you put your petrol <laughs> thing nozzle in. And it's kind of like, oh, my God, for years I've been getting out, you know, what size the petrol gauge on. Oh, I'll have a look. This and is it. Like when you have a higher car or a car that, you know, not yes. your car. Yeah. The These are knew? two ma- amazing moments for yes, me there, there along with your beautiful advice. I think maybe it's a sign of women being busy doing a lot of other things than filling the car up with petrol <laughs> or making a lovely meal. Do you know oh. what I mean? You've been very, very busy and I'm exactly the same. It's just been glorious to talk to you. Your humour and your truthfulness and your spirit really shines. And it's a great example for all us women to go after building brands brands that really matter and that we have fun in. And thank you, Mandy, so much for your time. I know you've got a shoot to go to. I do. So I'm not going to keep you, but bless you for being on Conversations of Inspiration. (laughs) Oh, thank you very much, Holly. It was really enjoyable. Thank you. Before you go, don't forget to head to adobe.com slash go slash Holly Tucker to find out how Adobe Express can fuel creativity in your business. And if you've enjoyed this episode, if it's helped you along your journey or inspired you, would you mind rating and reviewing? Your support means the world to me. It really does spread the word and will help inspire even more people to build a life they love. And if you want to hear all our latest news, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter, Holly's Desk Notes, over at holly.co. Holly.co.